My name is Dan Cohen. Uh, I live in Irvine, California, and I drive a 1995 Nissan 240SX. So at a young age, I always remember kind of just being in the car. I grew up on the East Coast uh, in New Jersey, and uh, I just stared out the window as a toddler and just watched cars go past. And for some reason, I was fascinated by the movement of cars and the uh, visual aesthetics of them. Um, so I just started to memorize cars as they go by. And then my first real you know, introduction to the modifying car world was the Fast and the Furious that came out in you know, 2000, 2001-ish. And I was 11 years old at the time. Um, and I saw Letty's car was a S14 Kuki. Um, and lo and behold, my dad happened to buy a Zenki 1995 Nissan 240SX off the dealer lot as a station car. Um, and it was just a, a, a car to get him to the train station and back as he commuted to New York City for work. And no one thought this car was gonna be super cool. And uh, lo and behold, the Fast and the Furious blew up that model. And uh, I said, Dad, I, I want that car. And after a few short years, I got a little bit older, got my learner's permit, and uh, he gifted me the vehicle as my first vehicle to have. So, I mean, this car has been through many stages. If I can dig up old photos, I will uh, definitely send them to Miguel. He can uh, post them up, but uh, it went through those phases, right? I had a you know 212 in the trunk. I had a wide, whitish body kit on it and uh, different wheels with horrible offsets as the days uh, were earlier and it's been through at least three or four different paint colors and uh, bad paint jobs, good ones. So it's almost like it transitioned through the years of the styling um, to where it is today as a cleaner car as I got, I guess you could say more mature and a little bit older. Um, but this car has seen a lot of different phases and uh, different generations of looks, you could say. I mean, this car was, I grew up riding in the back seat when my feet couldn't even reach the driver's seat, um, you know, the booster seats, everything in the back. And I remember the day my dad bought it from Haldeman Nissan. I still have the receipt. Uh, it was Ruby Pearl at the time. He traded in an 86 stanza. And, uh, you know, this car has been with us, you know, my entire life. <laughs> Oh yeah, definitely went through the body kit era. I mean, I loved body kits. I was always on bodykits.com and Andy's, you know, I forget what's called, Andy's Auto's House or something like that back in the day. And growing up in New Jersey, there wasn't a lot of big car culture like there is in Southern California. So it was always harder to acquire parts or even find stuff to watch or look into. Um, but I was a big body kit guy and uh, I have pictures of other body kits that were on it and big side skirts and rear bumpers and everything going on. But uh, like I mentioned, I got a little bit older, matured, and just kind of wanted more of a clean OEM Plus look, which is as it sits today. To me, you know, OEM Plus is, you know, as it comes from the factory, but little enhancements to either improve the drivability, the performance, or the aesthetics of the car. So I wanted stuff that maybe would come in the OE catalog as additional parts that you could get, and then add a little bit more to it as my own flair, whether it be you know slightly more aggressive wheels and tires, but not completely changing the entire look to kind of save the body lines of the vehicle as it came from the factory. And then it's almost interesting how the times changed or as you know, custom car progression changed, so did the looks and the styling of the vehicles. And even today you're seeing, you know, impacts from the late 90s, early 2000s are coming back, whether it be the big colorful wraps and you know bright colors and wide body kits that are everywhere now. For me, growing up in high school in New Jersey, you know, it was always those late night car meets and I was always looking for the movie theater parking lot or the mall parking lot or like the roller skating rink parking lot where, you know, back in the day we didn't have Instagram and really Facebook at that time. So it was all just kind of on those old school forums, which I still go on, zilvia.net and different ones like that. 
Um, but it was always late night, driving around, kind of doing the hoonigan stuff as a kid where I was drifting and messing around with the vehicle. And it's funny because nowadays I don't go to any car meets, you know, after noon. Um, they're always 6 a.m., older kind of crowd, cars and coffee, low key. Um, or back in the day, that was never me, and it was always about just you know driving fast on the freeways, late nights at night, and uh, messing around with the other 240 guys, just trying to drift any turn we could. I was involved in like an import tuner crew, right? So like, still, I mean, it wasn't a super popular car, um, but back you know growing up, I had a crew of people. Whether it be, it's funny, you know, you think about some names that come to mind right now, uh, Antonio Calvo, you know, he's Calvo Motorsports in Austin, Texas, and he grew up in West Windsor, a couple minutes away from me, and I, he was a little bit older than me, and I saw his cars he was building, you know, 300ZXs and Supras back in his time, and uh, another name, Dave Tormey, who uh, helped start Can I Beat, and went on to do a lot of amazing things with uh, the car culture with his Honda Civic and S2000, and it's funny to see him now in a, an E30 M3, OEM plus, you could say, um, but those are kind of the guys that influenced me uh, at a young age. They were about you know four to five years older, and I always envisioned, wow, these guys have such fast cars, they're cool cars, they're really awesome guys. Uh, and I tried to follow them the different meets that they were hosting and uh, you know attending to kind of learn from them and the whole car culture. It's funny, right? I think as you, uh, whether it be you grow up or um, you, you maybe get higher paying jobs or whatever it may be, you're your goals change. And as a kid, you know, JDM was kind of the only thing that I could afford to modify because even back then, you know, buying German aftermarket parts is ridiculously more expensive than a Japanese car or a, a K car or anything else. Um, and then when you kind of have that extra money to play around with, you kind of look at other options, whether it be German or European or anywhere else you're looking for. Um, it's funny because they say, oh, you go in from JDM, then you go to Euro, and then the BMW guy turns into the Porsche guy, and you know, vice versa. So, um, me, I'm never gonna be able to sell this car. It has way too much sentimental value, and I kinda, it's funny when you go to these cars and coffees, and you have the older generation, and they see this car, and it brings back memories, and they wish they didn't sell, or they're still, you know, the Honda guys that held on to their EKs and EGs, or, you know, DSMs, and all those different Mitsubishis back in the day. It's, it brings back a, a nostalgia to them where, you know, maybe their new Porsche GT3 RS is incredibly fast and fun, but it doesn't have the, you know, the soul of, you know, these cars that have way less uh, additions and driving and uh, aesthetics. I definitely do. You know, I, back in the day, you could have bought a clean one like this for, you know, sub 5,000. Um, and I don't think, I haven't found one yet, but for that price point, you really are looking at more of a rusted, you know, tracked out, drifted car with, uh, you know, non-clean Carfax. Um, but I do see the Japanese cars starting to gain some more momentum, as you can see in the Skyline world and GTRs that you know, are now topping a million dollars for some models, which was never the case 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I do think the 240SX will eventually, you know, I don't think it'll ever be um, the cult classic of a GTR and you know, some of the Type Rs out there and you know, some of the special breed of the Evos. But um, I do think it is getting more of uh, respect and reputation and you're seeing some of that uh, justified by the market. Span, you know, we kind of grew up on the Fast and Furious movies and that kind of car culture, whether it be um, Super Street magazines, and I still have my HCI, Hot Compact and Import magazines, and those kind of things. And it was really our, you know, um, our generation. When you look at the older generation that might have had the American muscle, you know, those had a real big high with Barrett Jackson, you know, maybe 10 years ago, but you're almost starting to see that generation just, you know, die off due to age. Um, and we're not really interested in those vehicles. Right now I see, you know, some of the people that grew up w lusting these cars are now able to have that kind of money to spend extra cash for them. Um, and I'm seeing that market tick up. I do think it will hit a peak, just like the generation below us who really doesn't care about this at all and kind of want, they want instant power or the newer BMWs or electric. Um, so I do see it rising maybe another 10, 15, 20 years. And then again, just like the hot rods or the classics of the 70s will you know, slowly have a demise as well. 360s, Ferrari 360s, you know, 10 years ago were dirt cheap. 
But now we're at a point where we grew up with that car on our wall as a poster car and we have the ability to get it and it's supply and demand now that we're driving the market up ourselves due to our generation. Um, you know, and eventually I think it will come down as the next generation, you know, their poster car was, is gonna be the 488, right? And maybe that will have a demise in a little ways and then it will pop back up when that generation can slowly afford those kind of cars. So I do think it goes in ebbs and flows, um, but right now I still see the Japanese market, you know, going on an uphill climb. So, I mean, the Nissan 240SX, for them, for those people that are watching that are not the most familiar, there's a couple generations of them. S13 is extremely popular. That's the generation before this, 89 to 94, I wanna say. And then the S14 generation, 1995 until 1998. And then the S15, which was 1999 until, I forget when they killed that off. It might've been around 2002 or so. Um, in America, we never got the S15, which is extremely sought after. Uh, spec S, Spec R versions as well. Um, this is the S14, which was available worldwide, and there were a facelift version, which would be the Kuki. This is the Zenki. A lot of people do change the Zenki to the Kuki. Um, I was n never one of those people. I never wanted to. I just thought it was proper, and I thought the lines flow perfectly with the headlights on this vehicle. Um, so I kept it the same. And then the S13s, I believe, are a lot more common. You can find a lot more of them. Um, but they were a smaller package, so some people prefer them for drifting. This was a little bit heavier of a vehicle in the S14 generation, but I just think the body lines on this car are timeless. Um, one day if I can get an S15 at an affordable price, as I was talking about the Japanese markets kind of going nuts right now, um, that would be awesome to have. It would just have to, you know, for me to learn how to drive on the other side of the car. And the motor offerings, um, the 240SX was called the 240SX because it was a 2.4 liter motor uh, in America. Um, overseas it was called the 200SX or the Silvia and 200B for a two liter. Uh, this motor that I swapped into, it originally came with a KA, um, and I swapped in an SR20, which was pretty much the most common swap you can do as it's direct bolt-in, and you get great power added compared to a KA motor. Um, some people say the downside is the SR is an aluminum block, where the KA is a steel block. So if you are pushing some big power, um, the ability to have the steel is, uh, in some people's eyes, a lot better. Um, the SR came in a couple of different variations. I have the notchback block top, so it has a little bit extended at the back of the motor, which I can show you later. Uh, and I did a fully built motor on this one. Um, so I have all the, pretty much everything from the Tomei catalog, uh, Brian Crower um, turbo kit from Tomei and Haltech, and it makes some good power. So I'm super happy with it, but a lot of people will also swap in an LS, just bulletproof V8 motor. Um, but yeah, came with a KA 2.4 with roughly, I want to say 120 horsepower from the factory. Yeah, so I mean, this build has got many generations, many different modifications and times, but uh, the most recent is the, uh, the engine I did about, it's already been about two years, which is hard to believe, but um, I took my SR, opened it up, and we did a full entire rebuild. So uh, I worked with Tomei, uh, Brian Crower, CP Carrillo, Hall Tech, uh, spec clutches for the clutch components, um, but it's fully built, fully forged. Uh, Tomei's latest turbo kit, bottom mount still, um, ball bearing, and uh, right now it makes 419 horsepower to the wheels and 393 torque. It is catless, it is uh, Tomei's titanium exhaust, and um, plenty of power for what I'm looking for honestly. Yeah, so obviously Southern California loves to crack down on um, different car things. So uh, it's, it's always difficult at times when driving around, but as long as I think you're respectful and uh, you know the ins and outs of different scenarios, um, I think it's definitely possible to drive these vehicles here in Southern California still. I happen to do some business in uh, Montana, so we're able to uh, work that out where it's uh, for shows and events that I attend due to the great company I work for, XCOM Tires, which this car is equipped with. Um, but it's definitely, you know, you look down, you look down on, I guess you could say, in different areas, just having a modified cars and these, you know, the day that we're in with, um, you know, health standards and the world and greenhouse and all that kind of stuff. But there's just something soulful about uh, hearing the exhaust and starting a car and you know having the soul of a vehicle to drive with. Other modification wise I went through pretty much everything uh, nothing has been unturned on this vehicle. Um, full suspension by Fortune Auto and uh, Cusco so I used all Cusco's uh, components their arms their tie rods all that kind of stuff and uh, Devin Henderson over at Fortune Auto amazing guy if you have suspension questions give him a shout. Um, he set me up I believe it's the 5100 series of their brand new coilovers that they have. 
Um, Willwood, I have the Willwood big brake kit in the fronts. Um, the rears are still stock. Um, they don't have a kit for the rears kit, but uh, the fronts are Willwood. Um, modification wise, as I said, OEM Plus, uh, I went with Kuki side skirts. So on the Kuki version, these came from the factory. Uh, the rear bumper is a Kuki style rear bumper with the spats on the side, again, OEM Plus. The front bumper is a Nismo 270R bumper. So uh, the famous Nismo 270R is a sought after vehicle. It was based on the Zenki, kind of like the Nismo uh, GTR 400R. Um, and that's what that bumper is uh, from. They had made a couple of those. And the interior wise, uh, just an auto power four point cage, Sparco Evo seats, um, and a Momo steering wheel. But other than that, it's completely you know stock on the inside, Nismo shift mob, little bits like that. Um, car's running E85. It's on a Haltech uh, Elite system. And uh, as mentioned, spec clutch, and it's a stage three clutch. So it has a very minimal, small catch point. But other than that, um, it's a joy to drive. You know, I'm not gonna daily drive this car at all, but every Saturday morning when I can wake up, you know, at 6 a.m. or so, brisk air, and just pound through canyons and PCH, of course, which is right here, um, there's just no better feeling. 240SX in one sentence. Uh, I'd say for a car person that's looking for, you know, driving, it's, it's the most, I don't know, it's the most soulful car you can get for under 20 grand. I appreciate everyone for tuning in and watching this video. And uh, if you guys have any uh, questions, you could always shoot me a message on Instagram. It's uh, tire.man.dan. And that's because I work for, like I said, one of the greatest tire companies, XCOMP Tires. If you guys need tires, please hit me up. More than happy to get you guys some discounts. 18 inch through 21, 200 treadwear. Um, and then follow us on Instagram as well, XCOMP Tires.